Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's headline roundup. Uh, you know we've got a lot to get uh, get to today. Dennis has got a great roundup uh, set up for us. So, without further ado, Dennis, you ready? Let's go. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late, everybody. That's technology, but uh, it is September 12. Hope everybody had a good holiday. Uh, good sized group today, it looks like. If anybody uh, has a question or comment as we go through the material, uh, there is in the control box that I believe will be on the right hand side of your screen a place for you to enter questions. Uh, Mark will help me keep an eye on that as we go through the webinar today. And uh, I'll be glad to answer questions or pass on any comments that you might have as well. So that said, I want to talk about Europe on the ropes. How will the U.S. be affected? Michael Snyder uh, had a piece uh, on this. Uh, I want to talk a bit about a housing update and Alistair McLeod, who is a frequent guest on the RLA radio program, um, has uh, a very interesting article about a Russian gold standard that's emerging. This is something that we have been uh, talking about uh, ultimately really since the new retirement rules book was published when we talked about the uh, currency money cycle. So let me go ahead and jump in and there's some crazy things going on in Europe as a result of the world energy situation. Uh, energy costs here are going up, but nothing like Europe. Um, in fact, uh, I got my electric bill that I just paid uh, about a week ago for September. Uh, I looked at the bill and thought, wow, that seems like a lot. And I went back and looked at my usage and my usage was actually down, but my bill was up. And on a kilowatt hour basis, uh, my electric costs were up about 16 and percent year to year. So I know you guys are probably all experiencing the same thing. Uh, that here in the US, I would attribute largely to uh, inflation, the currency creation by the Federal Reserve. Uh, in Europe, it's a little bit different story. They rely really on a lot of Russian energy uh, for their, uh, to, to meet their energy needs, for the, their electric, for their, their heating needs and their cooling. Um, Snyder talked about this. He said, could you imagine being sent to prison for three years if you dared to set your thermostat above 66 degrees Fahrenheit? As you will see below, this is a proposed regulation that's actually being considered in a major European country right now. If you've not been paying much attention to what's happening in Europe, you need to wake up. Natural gas in Europe is seven times more expensive than it was early last year. 700% increase in the cost of natural gas. Now I happen to heat my home with natural gas and I cannot imagine a power, uh, a gas bill that would be seven times what it was last year. If you can just imagine that for a minute, that's what's going on in Europe. Now that's due to currency creation, but also not only the war in Ukraine, but uh, more accurately, it is due to the sanctions that have been imposed against Russia. Over the past few decades, the Europeans foolishly allowed themselves to become extremely dependent on gas from Russia. More than 55% of the natural gas that Germany uses comes from Russia. But now the war has changed everything and Europe is facing an extremely harsh winter of severe shortages, mandatory rationing, and absolutely insane heating bills. Things are going to get very cold and very dark all over Europe in the months ahead and, ahead, and those Europeans that choose to rebel against the new restrictions that are being implemented could literally find themselves in prison. And well, that sounds like maybe a bit of an exaggeration, Switzerland is actually, as you can see here, they're considering jailing anyone who heats their rooms above 19 Celsius for three years if the country is forced to ration gas due to the Ukraine war. The country could also give fines to those who violate the new proposed regulations. Speaking to Blick, Marcus Spornley, who is a spokesman for the Federal Department of Finance, explained that the rates for fines on a daily basis could start at 36 francs, which is 26 euro. Now, 19 degrees Celsius, Snyder explains, is just 66 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you live in Europe, you better prepare to dress very warmly this winter. Now, some may be anticipating they will just use portable radiant heaters to keep things toasty, but apparently such heaters would not be allowed under the new regulations that Switzerland is considering. 
Blick also reported that radiant heaters would not be allowed and saunas and swimming pools, they have to stay cold. You can't have a hot tub, you can't have a sauna, you can't have a heated swimming pool. Snyder says this is serious. That's obviously stating the obvious. We've never seen anything like this before and the longer the war in Ukraine stretches on, the worse the energy crisis in Europe will become. An end to the era of cheap energy also means that a severe economic slowdown is in the cards and this is already starting to show up in the numbers. Europe is showing signs of heading into a recession. I would argue the world is already in a recession and I've made that case last week and uh, over the past several weeks actually. As multiple economic surveys show the region's services and manufacturing sectors slowing down while a large number of the continent's citizens are struggling to cope with rising prices. The Standard & Poor's Global Eurozone Composite Output Index fell to an 18-month low in August. The Eurozone private sector moved into contractionary territory in August, that is recession. Both services and manufacturing output fell for the month. Of course, what we have witnessed so far is just the beginning. Things are likely to get really bad this winter. German economic minister Robert Habeck has publicly admitted that some parts of the German economy will simply stop producing for the time being. Now, this is not some analyst, not some pundit. This is the economic minister of Germany who said there are some parts of the German economy that are just going to stop producing. And Snyder says this is already starting to happen. Here's a quote from a news article from uh, Snyder's piece. And yet another truly astonishing announcement that demonstrates the desperation of this hour, a German steelmaker, ArcelorMittal, one of the largest steel production facilities in Europe, has shuttered operations due to high energy prices. With gas and electricity prices increasing tenfold within just a few months, we are no longer competitive in a market that is 25% supplied by imports. That's according to the CEO. Gas and electric prices have gone up tenfold within just a few months. If you can imagine that, if your electric bill at your house was $200 a few months ago, it's now $2,000 a month. This is absolutely crazy. This comes after announced closures of aluminum smelters, copper smelters, and ammonia production plants over the past few weeks. Ammonia, necessary for fertilizer, is now 70% offline in the EU. So what does this do to food supplies down the road? All this has legs. One sector affects another sector, and because energy costs are going up, that means food production will ultimately be affected as well. Snyder says more factories will be forced to shut down in the coming months. Deeply alarmed by what is taking place, 40 chief executive officers from Europe's metal industry have jointly issued an open letter in which they warn that their companies are facing an existential threat to our future. Here's a bit from the news article that Snyder is quoting. Ahead of Friday's emergency summit, the business leaders of Europe's non-ferrous metals industry are writing together to raise the alarm about Europe's worsening, worsening energy crisis and its existential threat to our future. Our sector has already been forced to make unprecedented curtailments in the last 12 months. We are deeply concerned that the winter ahead could deliver a decisive blow to many of our operations. And we call on the European Union and member state leaders to take emergency action to preserve their strategic electricity intensive industries and prevent permanent job losses. I think that that will likely not happen. I think those job losses we're already starting to see. A couple of weeks ago, I talked to you guys about the massive layoffs that are already occurring. 50% of the European Union's aluminum and zinc capacity has already been forced offline due to the power crisis. 
There's also been significant curtailments in silicone and ferro alloys production. And further impacts have been felt across copper and nickel sectors. In the last month, several companies ha have had to announce indefinite closures and many more on the, are on the brink of a life or death winter for many operations. Producers face electricity and gas costs over 10 times higher than last year, far exceeding the sales price of their products. We know from experience that once a plant is closed, it very often becomes a permanent situation as reopening implies significant uncertainty and cost. Snyder says this is what an economic collapse looks like. Things are already so bad that scientists are even considering shutting down the large Hadron Collider. Europe's energy crisis is being felt by everyone, including the scientists working deep underground in Switzerland at the large Hadron Collider. The European Organization for Nuclear Research, better known as CERN, is even considering taking its particle accelerators offline. This is due to the accelerator's high energy demands and the organization's desire to keep the region's electricity grid stable. So at least one good thing could potentially come out of this crisis, but overall the months ahead are going to be an immensely uncomfortable time for Europe. As conditions become tougher and tougher, ordinary Europeans are going to become angrier and angrier. The Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, is openly admitting there will be civil unrest. But he insists Europeans must make sacrifices in order to support the war in Ukraine. Here's another article that Snyder quotes, Vladimir Putin's energy blackmail over Europe could lead to civil unrest this winter. See, the bottom line here is that the sanctions against Russia have made it miserable for Europe, have increased energy costs there because they're very dependent upon Russian energy. But actually, Russian energy profits are higher than they have been in the past. So these sanctions, regardless as to the geopolitical situation that led to them, these sanctions have completely backfired. Stoltenberg and acknowledge the winter will be hard as families and businesses feel the crunch of soaring energy prices and cost of living in the coming months. Writing in the Financial Times, a very credible publication, the boss of the Western Security Alliance said that it's worth paying the price to support Ukraine. Eventually, Snyder says there will be tremendous civil unrest in major cities in the United States as well. We are still only, according to Snyder, in the very early stages of this new global energy crisis and it's going to turn all of our lives upside down. Now, the housing market continues to slow. We've been reporting on this. We haven't seen it really turn in earnest yet, but I believe that by the end of the year, we will do that. This is an article from CNBC. The headline, as you can see, one in five home sellers are now dropping their asking price as the housing market cools. And again, if you guys have a question or a comment, go ahead and type it in the question box. And uh, Mark, at this point, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'll just remind there people. Are two. There, there are two. There are two. Get to them. Uh, <clears throat> would this be a good time to answer those questions? Uh, they're both along the lines of what you just covered so probably um, okay the, the, the but they both come from jeff the first one is given jerome powell's comments at jackson hole on august 26 about restoring price stability uh will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time what is your current prognosis for a fed flip well First of all, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in what anybody from the Fed says. And I, I say that obviously uh, with some level of cynicism, but I think it is uh, cynicism that is well-founded. Um, I expect that the Fed will still flip. Uh, I believe that uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, reason number one is that uh, as we've discussed, in order to get inflation under control, you have to have real positive interest rates. And we are a long way from that. 
And when I say real positive interest rates, we have to have interest rates that are higher than the inflation rate. So even with the heavily manipulated consumer price index, we have interest rates that are now still well below the inflation rate. I think because uh, we're not going to get inflation under control and because the economy at the same time will move into what I believe will be a stagflationary environment, I expect the Fed to say, well, let's at least try to jumpstart the economy because we've lost the inflation battle. So I, I believe that's still how things will play out. Um, I think that uh, that that flip or that that pivot, to use a term that's often used now, um, and at least alternative news sources, uh, I believe we could see that, you know, maybe by the end of this year or into the first half of next year. So that that would be my opinion. Um, I think that uh, we we are are seeing a bit of a reprieve here in stocks. Um, uh, U.S. Treasuries had a a very miserable week, um, so I expect that. Uh, as asset prices decline, that the Fed will will pivot. So I think that'll be the catalyst that will will make them uh, uh, alter what they're saying publicly. And the second part of his question, I think you pretty well answered here. So uh, uh, we can move on. All right. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. So this is again from the CNBC article: How home sellers are getting nervous as the once hot housing market cools fast. One in five sellers in August dropped their asking price, according to Realtor.com. A year ago, that share was just 11%. The average home sold for less than its list price for the first time in over 17 months for the four-week period ended August 28th. That's, by, that's according to a report by Redfin. That's a pretty significant statistic. For the first time in over 17 months, over a four-week time frame, Nobody was bidding up the price of homes. Homes actually sold for less than the list price. That tells you things are starting to turn. Um, and I certainly believe that that is the case. Homes are simply not selling at the breakneck pace they were six months ago when strong demand butted up against tight supply. Bidding wars were the norm and a seller could often get a signed contract in under a weekend. Homes in August sat on the market an average of five days longer than they did a year ago. That's the first annual increase in time on the market in more than two years. The supply of homes for sale is also rising up fast, up 27% from a year ago, even as fewer sellers decide to list. There are a couple of areas that I monitor real estate inventories, and that has been my experience as well. We're seeing inventories go up uh, uh, meaningfully and in pretty big numbers. Pending sales in July, which represent signed contracts on existing homes, and which are the most recent sales data available, were 20% lower than in July of 21. That's according to the National Association of Realtors. So again, home sales are continuing to slow as we have been discussing. Danielle Hale, who is the chief economist at Realtor.com said this, for many of today's buyers, the uptick in for sale home options is taking away the sense of urgency they felt during the past two years when inventory was scarce. As a result of this shift, coupled with higher mortgage rates, competition continued to cool in August with listing price trends indicating that home shoppers are tightening their purse strings. The median listing price in August dropped to 435,000 down from 449,000 in July. <laughs> excuse me, mortgage rates continue to go up. Uh, Wolf Richter reported that the holy moly six and a quarter percent mortgage is back. Treasury yields spike. If you look at this week's portfolio watch, the 30 year US Treasury is now at about three and a half percent. Richter points out that stocks and bonds are moving together. They used to be diversified, they used to be inversely correlated, but not anymore. They have both been down year to date. And as he reports here, the average 30 year fixed mortgage rate was back to six and a quarter percent on Tuesday. Um, 30 year mortgage rates, as you can see here, are now at all highs that we have not seen in a very long time. Saw a bit of a pullback here, but now we have seen uh, mortgage rates make new highs. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, I want to talk about what Alistair McLeod wrote this past week, as uh, you have been long, many of you who have been long time 
participants in the headline roundup newscast know, I uh, very much appreciate the work of Mr. McLeod. He wrote uh, on September 8th, uh, just this past week, that the financial war between Russia with China's backing on one side and America and her NATO allies on the other has escalated rapidly. Notice he uses the term financial war. It appears that President Putin was thinking several steps ahead when he launched Russia's attack on Ukraine. We have seen sanctions fail. Undoubtedly, sanctions have failed. Russia now has record export surpluses. The ruble, the Russian currency, is now the strongest currency on the foreign exchanges. Because in response to the sanctions, Russia said, well, if you want to buy our energy, you need gold or rubles. That has strengthened the Russian economy because they need, countries need, customers need Russian energy. We are seeing the West enter a new round of European monetary inflation to pay everyone's energy bills. The Euro, the Yen and Sterling are already collapsing and the dollar will be next. McLeod writes from Putin's point of view, so far, so good. We are seeing the West enter a new round of European monetary inflation to pay everyone's energy bills. As I stated, Russia has progressed her power over Asian nations, including populous India and Iran. Russia has persuaded Middle Eastern oil and gas producers that their future lies with Asian markets and not European markets. Russia is subsidizing Asia's industrial revolution with discounted energy. Thanks to the West sanctions, Russia is on its way to confirming Halford McKinder's predictions made over a century ago that Russia is the true geopolitical center of the world. Now there is one piece of Putin's jigsaw yet to be put in place, a new currency system to protect Russia and her allies from an approaching Western monetary crisis. This article argues that under cover of the West geopolitical ineptitude, Putin is now assembling a new gold-backed multi-currency system by combining plans for a new Asian trade currency with his new Moscow world standard for gold. Now, I would encourage you to go read this entire article. I am going to give you highlights. McLeod says, unreported by Western media, there are some interesting developments taking place in Asia over the future of currencies. Earlier this summer, it emerged that Sergei Glazchev, a senior Russian economist and minister in charge of the European Eurasian Economic Commission, was leading a committee planning a new trade currency for the Eurasian Economic Union. I reported that here on the Headline Roundup webinar. As put forward in Russian and Eurasian Economic Commission media, the new currency is to be comprised of a mixture of national currencies and commodities. A weighting of some sort was suggested to reflect the relative importance of the currencies and commodities traded between them. At the same time, the new trade settlement currency was to be available to any other nation in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the expanding BRICS membership. The ambition is for it to become an Asian-wide replacement for the dollar. As I've talked about in the past, this currency replacement would affect about 30% of world GDP or gross domestic product. Now, more specifically, the purpose is to do away with the dollar for trade settlements on cross-border transactions between participants. It's worth noting that any dollar transaction is reflected in U.S. banks through the correspondent banking system, giving U.S. authorities undesirable economic intelligence. See, any dollar-based transaction clears through the SWIFT system, and U.S. authorities know about the transaction. And if transactions take place in U.S. dollars, McLeod points out that U.S. politicians now can intervene. They can get in the way of it. So Russia is now 
developing this Moscow gold standard that McLeod talks about. He suggests that logic will tells you that gold back, a gold backed currency will be the outcome. Um, in accordance with Western sanctions, the London bullion market refused to accept Russia mined and processed gold. So Russia said, okay, we'll just start a new gold market based in, in, in Moscow. We'll, we'll make our own rules. <clears throat> so McLeod says that as long as Russia has done this, now it's sensible for Russia to set up a price fixing committee replicating what the LBMA does. But instead of it being the basis for a far larger unallocated gold deposit account offering by Russian and other banks, it will be a physical market. In other words, it won't have the leverage that LBMA does. Based in Moscow, with a new market called the Moscow International Precious Metals Exchange, the Moscow gold standard will incorporate some of the LBMA's features, such as good delivery lists with daily or twice daily fixings. This is being promoted as a replacement for the LBMA. But McLeod asks a very good question here. Could that be cover? Could the real objective be to provide a gold link to the new trade currency planned by this committee? Timing suggests that this might be the case, a gold-backed currency. That would be devastating for other fiat currencies. And McLeod says if this is to be backed by gold, the considerations behind setting up a new trade currency are fairly straightforward. There is the Chinese one kilo bar 49 standard, which is widely owned. It's already been adopted throughout Asia and it's even traded on the COMEX. Given that China is Russia's long-term partner, that is likely to be a standard unit. The adoption of the Chinese standard in the new Moscow exchange is logical. It would simplify the relationship that the Moscow gold exchange would have with the Shanghai gold exchange, and it would streamline fungibility between contracts, arbitrage, and delivery because they would be using the same metrics. Geopolitics suggests that the simple proposition between the establishment of a new Moscow exchange will fit in with, larger trans, with a larger Trans-Asia plan, and it is unlikely to move at the glacial pace of developments between Russia and China to which we have become accustomed. In other words, McLeod says this is likely to move a lot faster. The gold question has become bound up in more rapid developments triggered by Russia's belligerence over Ukraine and the sanctions which quickly followed. There can be little doubt this must be leading to a seismic shift in gold policy for the Russian-Chinese partnership. The Chinese in particular have demonstrated an unhurried patience that befits a nation with a sense of its long history and destiny. Putin is more of a one-man act. McLeod observes that Putin is approaching 70 years old he can't afford to be so patient and is showing a determination to secure a legacy in his lifetime as a great Russian leader. Well, China has made the initial running with respect to gold policy. Putin is now pushing the agenda a lot more forcefully. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the strategy was to let the West make all the geopolitical and financial mistakes. For Putin, perhaps the lesson of history was informed by Napoleon's march to the gates of Moscow. Uh, where he was defeated. Hitler made the same mistake. Putin got the lessons. Russian enemies defeat themselves. This happened in Afghanistan. And that's why Mackinder's pivot area, uh, the, the, the thing we talked about earlier, the, 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 the forecast earlier that Russia was the world's geopolitical center may be coming true. Following the Ukraine invasion, Putin's financial strategy has become a lot more aggressive and is potentially at odds with China's economic policy. Being cut off from Western markets, Putin is now proactive, while China, which exports goods to them, probably remains more cautious. But China knows 
that Western capitalism bears the seeds of its own destruction, which would mean the end of the dollar and other major fiat currencies. An economic policy based on exports to a capitalistic to capitalistic nations would be a passing phase. China's gold policy was always an insurance policy against a dollar collapse. China realizes that China cannot be blamed for the West's financial destruction by announcing a gold standard in advance of it. It would be a nuclear equivalent in a financial war. They're just waiting for this to happen and then they'll implement the gold standard because it will look like they had no choice. Now, Russian developments have changed this a bit, according to McLeod. It's clear to the Russians and most likely the Chinese that credit inflation is now pushing the dollar into a currency crisis in the next year or two. Preparations to protect the ruble and the yuan from the final collapse of the dollar long taught in Marxist universities as inevitable must assume a new urgency. It would be logical to start with a new trade settlement currency as a test bed for national currencies in Asia, or does it be set up in a way that it would permit member states to adopt gold standards for their own currencies as well? The move away from Western fiat currencies to gold back Asian currencies requires significant gold bullion ownership. Now, interestingly, when you take a look at the Shanghai Corporation Organization and the EAEU, whose central banks have not increased their gold reserves since the Lehman failure, since then, between the two of them, they've added 4,645 tons of gold to their reserves. All other central banks, just 781 tons. So Russia, China, they have been stockpiling gold. This is, there's an appendix to this article, and I, I'm not going to share that with you, but I would encourage you to go check it out. But there is a very compelling argument to be made that China has almost certainly accumulated an undeclared quantity of bullying, bullion likely to be in the neighborhood of 25,000 tons. And that's by 2002. The U.S. purports to have 8,000 tons. It's unlikely in my view that the US actually has that. But to finish that thought, since 2002, further accumulation of gold has been 20,000 tons more. So, I mean, that is, that is a huge, huge number. Russia, according to Simon Hunt, holds about 12,000 tons. So between Russia and China, you could be looking at between 55 and 60,000 tons of gold. The US Treasury allegedly has about 8,000 tons. That is a big disparity. In a financial crisis, the accumulated manipulation of bullion markets since the 1970s is at significant risk of becoming unwound. This is what I've talked about. Uh, a lot of this is new information to me, but Fundamentally speaking, uh, you cannot print your way to prosperity. You cannot create currency and become prosperous. And history tells us this currency money cycle will revert and we will find that uh, once again, gold will become, or gold and silver will become currency. So McLeod finishes this, the imbalance in bullion holdings between the Russian Chinese camp in the West would generate the equivalent of a financial nuclear event because Russia and China have so much more gold. That is why it's so important to understand that instead of being a long stop insurance policy against the Marxist prediction of capitalism's ultimate failure, it appears that the combination of planning for a new trade currency for Asian nations centered on members of the EAEU, coinciding with the introduction of a new Moscow-based bullion standard is now preempting financial developments in the West. That being the case, a financial nuclear bomb is close to being triggered. So that's Alistair McLeod's opinion. That said, uh, that's what I have to cover today. I did go a bit over, I apologize for that. Uh, I will see if we have some questions here. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask me out? Yep, there are some questions starting uh, 
uh, with Casey who asked about uh, cryptocurrency and if the banking system continues to or devolve as you er uh, indicated earlier, uh, what recommendations, if any, would you have for uh, cryptocurrency? Well, um, I will first say that uh, I have never invested in cryptocurrency, nor I have advised anybody to invest in cryptocurrency. Arguably, you can look at what cryptocurrencies have done and make the case uh, very a very compelling case that that uh, was a mistake. Um, so that said, uh, cryptocurrencies, I believe, uh, don't have any tangible value. Um, I think the fact that uh, cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile and that there are now uh, central banks around the world moving for central bank issued digital currencies, I see the cryptocurrency arena as having a lot of long-term vulnerability. So I would recommend physical gold and silver in lieu of cryptos. That has been my advice, and I would not change that advice. All right. Uh, Jeff has a comment and a further question. Uh, Zero Hedge and other reputable publications have recently uh, published articles that German leaders are encouraging those who can to chop and store wood for heating their homes. Uh, also that uh, people in Poland are indicating lines of cars and trucks at the coal mines looking to stock up. If there truly is an energy crisis in Europe and their GDP output drops, what do you see will be the consequences and how will precious metals respond P.S. Gold and silver are both up today about 6.2 percent. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, and I was reading Jeff's question. He's got some uh, personal experience uh, in talking to people in Poland. I find that interesting, and I appreciate you sharing that, Jeff. Uh, but that, <clears throat> I did see the article about uh, the Zero Hedge article uh, that uh, you know German leaders are saying, "Hey, if you can cut wood to heat your home, you might want to get out there and uh, you know get busy." Um, uh, so, so that is happening, and the energy crisis, I think, is uh, is going to hit. Um, I think that uh, ultimately you're going to see uh, metals respond favorably because I think that central banks are not going to be get are not going to get inflation under control. I think there will be some uh, currency challenges, currency crises, whatever term you want to use. I think that will all benefit gold and silver. Um, I think that you're going to see paper assets uh, probably decline in value. And I think you're going to see physical assets uh, allow you to preserve and, uh, and and maintain your purchasing power. So uh, I haven't changed my mind. I am still long-term bullish on gold and silver. I mean, we had silver prices low enough that, you know, of late silver prices were actually below the production cost for most silver. So um, that is a situation that cannot occur uh, long term. History tells us that whenever we get to that point, that it precedes a price jump. And I haven't looked at the silver markets today. I've been in meetings all morning, but uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, we're seeing a jump. And I would expect that, you know, at some point here in the relatively new future, near future, I think you'll have to see metals respond favorably. Uh, so appreciate those comments. Um, we are well over our time today, Mark, but uh, I will hang around if there are any questions or comments other than what we've discussed. There was one last one, uh, Casey had a follow-up that if the dollar crashes, any advice on how you transition to digital? Well, I, I think that the jury's out on that, Casey. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think central banks would love to have a digital currency. I think politicians would love to have a digital currency. Um, I've been doing some research on Executive Order 14067. I'm not in a position that I really feel like I can I can comment on it uh, with any degree of reliability. Uh, but there is a move among politicians worldwide and among central bankers worldwide to a digital currency. Um, I think that they, they, I think it's gonna be difficult for a digital currency to completely take the place of cash 
barring a currency crisis. And then unless this digital currency is backed by something tangible, I think it's gonna be very, very difficult for, uh, for, for the bankers and the politicians to get the population to accept it. Uh, the currency money cycle historically always tells us that when there's currency failures or, or, or uh, trust is lost in the currency, that people look for something tangible again, something they can trust. And I, I can't imagine it will be different this time. So I think that may at least comment on your question, Casey, in a roundabout way. Hopefully I gave you some of the information you were looking for. That is all the questions we have. Yeah, I think we can conclude. Really good participation. Uh, I'll be back again next week on the 19th live. Uh, have a super week. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Again, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all back here at the same time next Monday. Have a great week. Take care.